Hello everyone, welcome to This Week in Medicine. It's September 6, 2022, and we're going back to school. It was a nice long summer, but it's time to get some education. So let's talk about This Week in Medicine. It's sponsored by the Fox Hall Foundation. We still have our educational mission. We are promoting, still doing talks, despite COVID, or because of COVID. Our current foundation initiatives are our stroke prevention program, which is outlined in You Can Prevent a Stroke, which is still available. It's a quick book. It's a nice read. Share it with your friends. At Fox Hall Wellness Center, we have Mr. Ricky running our programs. He runs an active master's movement program. And congratulations to Mr. Ricky. He was just inducted into the Taekwondo Hall of Fame. We are extremely proud of him. Uh, Carrie's still running our nutrition classes. She's excellent. You can reach her at Imbalanced Nutrition, PLLC, at gmail.com. And her work is also funded by the Fox Hall Foundation. This is our location in Chevy Chase. This was in the inbox. And guess what? This is the same inbox as about six weeks ago. You haven't heard from me in six weeks, but that's pretty much because the inbox has not changed. People are still asking if they should take Paxlovid. Uh, still asking if they should mask or not. It's really, at this point, personal decision. Most people, I would say, are not masking based on summer vacation travels. Uh, a lot of people are having antigen negativity, but they feel like they might have COVID. Uh, some people even have a negative PCR test. Some of this may be because of the typical back-to-school viral outbreaks that we get. There have been a lot of viruses in the past three weeks that probably are not covid uh, adenovirus, it causes laryngitis and bronchitis, a lot of respiratory syncytial virus or RSV that you see in little kids, that's been spreading to adults, parvovirus B19, which causes slap cheek or fifth disease, I've seen that as well. So the viruses are back and some of this is due to back to school and also due to limited masking. Um, most people are testing positive at home on a COVID test, so this makes monitoring difficult. A lot of people think they just have a cold, it's actually COVID, or they th think it's allergies, but it's COVID. Uh, am I a candidate for uh, lutetium-177 for prostate cancer? Uh, this and other breakthroughs in oncology are still helping patients, and this has started rolling out in our area. A lot of people still want to take Paxlovid when they travel. I think that's fine because it's not available elsewhere. I just think there's limited utility for Paxlovid and that is substantiated by research data and data that the company manufacturer Pfizer has also um, put out. Omicron BA4 and, and 5 are definitely still trending. So the only thing that's new is when should I get my bivalent booster? So that's what prompted uh, getting going today on this talk because many people are asking, when should I get my bivalent booster? And that's hitting my inbox a lot this past week. So before we discuss that, I wanna talk about influenza timing because besides the bivalent booster, you are hearing from the government and from media sites that you should also get your influenza shot at the same time that you get your bivalent booster. And I would ask you to reconsider that. Uh, some of this is because uh, the government sees that we are very busy people, a lot of us are back to work, and we may not have time to do two shots, a bivalent booster now and a flu shot in a month or two. But the flu shot really is most effective 90 days after it is injected. So if you get your flu shot now, in about two weeks, you will have protection against influenza. The question is, in two weeks, uh, in the middle of September or end of September, is there actually influenza that you need activity against? We'll talk about that. The answer is no. Um, there is a traditional pre-COVID influenza season, and in that traditional season, we'll show a graph of that, the peak is actually in February and April. So do the math. If you do your shot now and it lasts peak 90 days, is that going to cover you in February and April when influenza traditionally peaks? It's not. Um, so usually the efficacy of this shot against influenza is 20 to 50%. We call that the match. Does our influenza vaccine composition actually match what is circulating? It's not a perfect match. So if you combine a too early flu shot with a flu shot that traditionally doesn't match 100%, you're talking about some significantly decreased efficacy. Uh, doing the flu shot now is a public health message, not a personal message to you. Your personal message about when to do your shot really should be between you and your doctor and your family. The public health message is, let's get as many people vaccinated as possible. 
And so that means if you're going to do a bivalent vaccine now, you're already in the pharmacy, you're already in the doctor's office, why don't you get that flu shot? And that makes sense for a public health perspective, but it really doesn't protect you because influenza season is not traditionally right now. It's February and April. But the government wants everyone to get vaccinated. And so efficacy is not really part of their calculus. They want shots in arms. This is where the peak is for the annual influenza epidemic. For 1982-3 through before COVID, the season right before COVID, the peak was February. So you'll see some cases building in December and January, but really you want that 90 day post shot efficacy to cover here before COVID. It's changed. So this is a graph of the year before COVID. This is your, um, uh, from the CDC website, the data on influenza incidents. And you'll see it starts coming in December, but really starts peaking here in February. So I want my flu shot to be effective in February. So even though my local hospital is telling me way back here in September and October, get your flu shot now, I'm really gonna try and get my flu shot in November or December because I want my 90 days to cover this peak. Now again, this was in 2019, 2020. Let's take a look at 2021, 22, our most recent flu season. This curve doesn't look anything like that curve. What happened here? Well, we did have one spike that got a lot of media attention that was in October or November, but you don't see it on the graph. That was a media attention set of cases that happened on college campuses and universities. So these got a lot of attention, but statistically they were not relevant. Just because we had some influenza spikes in October, November, they didn't even make the graph. And then our graph for influenza kind of lost its peak in February and March. It doesn't look like this at all. We had a slow, steady rise, and we still had influenza cases in June. So this is what COVID has done to our usually predictable, it was like this every year, seasonal influenza pandemic. We don't do that anymore. As of this past year, we have a slow, steady rise. How are we going to get an influenza vaccine that typically lasts at most 90 days to cover December all the way to June? We can't get a vaccine that covers six months. So it's hard to predict what that 90 day period is going to be. We could go back to this. It might happen, but we just really don't know. This is what happened in 2020 to 21. Just right after we got COVID, the graph started getting messed up. And so we see that instead of that peak in February, we were still going up in April and May. And so this sort of steady slope rising up maybe predicted the next year, which was this most recent year, where instead of a peak and a slope, we ended up with this slow steady rise. So you can see from just these graphs from the CDC website that our influenza rates and peaks are completely thrown off by COVID. So it makes timing your flu shot difficult. But if we try to stick with this time of year when you want the most protection, I think that means you really don't want to get your flu shot now. So remember, this points out the public health versus the individual health message. The government is giving us a message for the public health, but be wary of applying public health messages to your personal health. And there are many examples of this. Cancer death rates. Just because we say a cancer might kill you 50% of the time, doesn't mean you're the 50%. You are one individual in a population set of data. We are giving you population data, not data specific to you. Chemotherapy success rates are the same thing. We'll say this chemotherapy works 50 to 75% of the time. Well, that's for a population, not for an individual. So it makes taking these public health messages into your individual health plan difficult. We were also told recently preventive baby aspirin is bad, but for who? You know, you have to be very specific about this. And for what? A preventive baby aspirin is great if your doctor thinks you are at risk for atrial fibrillation, a largely silent arrhythmia that increases your risk for stroke dramatically. If you happen to be taking a preventive baby aspirin and you have risk for atrial fibrillation, that could save you from a stroke. So again, you have to be very specific about these public health recommendations and how they apply to the individual. Just because the media says the government said or CDC said doesn't necessarily mean it applies to your individual health. 
We also have another example of cancer screening recommendations. We give these out to the general population, but for a family that carries the Lynch syndrome gene, those people have vastly different cancer screening recommendations than the rest of the public. So just be careful to filter your messages and realize a lot of these are for the public health. All right, let's talk about the bivalent booster. Bivalent booster, bi means two, we got that. So part of it is the old COVID infection, COVID-19, that's part one. Part two is Omicron 5A and 4A, we hope, because this vaccine was supposed to be against 1A. The government told the manufacturers, Pfizer and Moderna in June, we would like you to make this booster bivalent against the old COVID, COVID-19, but number two, we would like you to make it against not just 1A, but 4A and 5A. Did they? Did we get effective enough antibody neutralization against 4A and 5A, which are currently circulating? We don't know. The risk of hospitalization uh, with COVID is very low because many of us have been uh, vaccinated in the primary series and boosted. This is a good article from Allison Aubrey. And in this article, she quotes, according to the CDC data, and I will show you that in a minute because you can always click on these to go right to the data. People who have had one or two boosters have a 0.024% chance of being hospitalized. So that's probably most of the people I'm talking to right now. If you're watching this talk, you're probably one of those people. Look at how low your hospitalization rate is. And then for people under 50, it's even lower, it's 0.14%. So if your risk of being hospitalized with an infection right now from Omicron is that low, do you need the booster and do you want the booster? So this is where it came from. It came from the COVID data tracker and it's the rates of laboratory confirmed hospitalizations. This is where she extracted the data. And then you click one more and you can see this great slide, which shows you in green, the people not vaccinated and their very high hospitalization rates. And the people who've been vaccinated, this is, goes back to January, 2021 to current time. And then the hashtag line right here is people who had boosters. Hospitalization rates are negligible for people who have been vaccinated. So again, for the group I'm speaking to who are largely this group in the blue, a couple of you are here in the green, you don't want to be there. Uh, why would you get this bivalent booster right now? Because you're already so protected against hospitalization. Why? Because we're hoping that the neutralizing antibodies will work so that you won't get an infection. Because when our vaccines first came out, we were really happy because the current circulating COVID-19 actually got neutralized by our injections, by our immunization. But then the virus started mutating. And then all of a sudden we weren't talking about decreased infection or blocking infection. We were talking about decreased severity. So a lot of people are hoping, again, that if we match the antigens to the vaccine, like we do with influenza or we try to do with influenza, if we get a good match on this bivalent vaccine with current circulating Omicron, we could block infection and everybody wants that. So that would be a reason to get this vaccine. We just don't necessarily have the data that will tell us that that will happen. Not enough human data. And so it's not a matter of safety. This will be a safe vaccine. It's a matter of how much protection will it give us to block infection. Now, another, another interesting point is that there is a prediction that there will be a surge because people will be going indoors, but not necessarily that there will be a new mutation. If you look back at the past two and a half years, most of our surges were really spurred by new mutations. Knock on wood, we have not seen a new mutation because 4A and 5A have been circulating so long. So it's not necessarily seasonal. Seasonal does not predict surges in COVID infection. It's really new mutations. So that's what we're looking out for. If we have a new mutation, we have a new surge. And then another important point everyone's making, which is quite true, we don't test the flu shot for neutralizing antibodies. We make a good guess on our influenza vaccine and hope it's a match. When I talked about the match earlier, we're hoping for a good match with these bivalent vaccines. So why is this surge not ending? Well, probably because we haven't had a dominant mutation, something that's more dominant than 5A and 4A. Uh, we can't effectively track it anymore because everybody's home testing, thankfully. Um, but wastewater analysis is now even more important. So I'm gonna give you some examples of people who maybe need to consider more deeply whether or not they want to get this current bivalent. So we'll take the case of early Ellen. 
She held off on COVID booster. She did not have COVID. She didn't have any side effects from her booster, but her last booster was in 2021 and she's over 65. So let's make Ellen early. She needs to go in and get her bivalent vaccine now because she has waning immunity from 2021. She actually hasn't had COVID yet, so she doesn't know how severe it would be for her. Probably a lot of severity of COVID depends on the individual's immune system. So since she hasn't had COVID yet, she doesn't know how bad it might be for her. She's over 65 and has waning immunity. Recommendation for me, if Ellen is my patient, is to get the bivalent booster now. How about hold off Harry? I told Harry he should hold off. Harry had COVID in June. He only had mild symptoms. He is over 65, so that's a mitigating factor for increased severity and maybe the need for hospitalization. But he had more symptoms with the vaccine than he did with his illness. His illness was pretty mild, but the vaccine was hard for him. So my recommendation for Harry is to hold off. He should wait for 90 days because he had mild symptoms with COVID in June. He doesn't want to destroy this native immunity he created by getting COVID. So he's going to wait 90 days, sometime in October, because that's 90 days after June, to get his booster. If he gets his booster now, he may destroy the natural immunity he made from getting sick in June. He also had a mild illness, so he knows he could tolerate the illness if he got it again, if it broke through his 90-day immunity. He's not concerned because he didn't get hospitalized to begin with. Now, College Carrie is somebody who's in a lot of our homes, and so Carrie needs to know if she should get a booster. She had COVID already greater than 90 days ago, so that means her natural immunity probably isn't protecting her, but she didn't like being sick. She had two vaccines of mRNA and no booster because of her age, and she's otherwise healthy. This recommendation is tougher because she may be living in a dorm or in a community where control of the spread is very difficult if you're living among others, just like with influenza. So she could opt for the public health decision, if she's living in a dorm, that she should do this booster now, the bivalent, because it might actually neutralize her from getting infected and then she won't spread it to the rest of the dorm. Or she might make the personal decision to wait a few months to see if there is a match with this bivalent booster and it actually does neutralize the current circulating Omicron. Immunosuppressed Ivan is in trouble. He has chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which already decreases your immunity against COVID. He's not on treatment, but that doesn't matter. You're still at increased risk for COVID severity if you have chronic leukemia. So he probably should just go ahead and get the booster. Discuss it with his oncologist for any nuances, but this is a kind of patient who should be talking to their specialists about whether or not they're getting a booster now. So now what if you got COVID? And we've been going through this for the past couple of months with a lot of patients on an individual basis. So let's say you got Omicron anyway. You were boosted, you had the original vaccine series, but as we discussed, these are not neutralizing antibodies anymore. They don't neutralize Omicron. They might have neutralized COVID-19. That's what the vaccine was made for. So you get Omicron. Omicron is what I'm calling backloaded for infectivity and contagion. By backloaded, I mean you're more contagious potentially after you get the illness than before. What we used to talk about with COVID is that there was a very contagious period, maybe one to two days before you actually had symptoms, before you had a fever, before you knew you had COVID, you were spreading it. This virus isn't quite like that. I'm saying it's backloaded because your contagious period is from the day that you have symptoms, potentially as long as 20 days. So the time that people are actually probably spreading it is not before they're sick, but after they're better. And so that's what I mean by backloaded. We used to have front-loaded contagion where you were sick for the first day or two before you got a fever and chills and knew you had COVID. But now what's happening is you're contagious even potentially after you've recovered. So you think you're better, your sore throat is gone, your cough is gone, your fever is gone. So you think, I'm not contagious anymore. And that is not true. You, multiple authorities are saying if your antigen test is positive, even if you feel better, you're likely contagious. And that may be part of why 5A and 4A spread so much and why we have had so many cases and why people who are able to avoid COVID for the past two and a half years are finally starting to get it because we probably have a lot of people going around thinking that they are better. 
they feel better, they're no longer contagious. But if you check an antigen test, it is still positive. And that's why we recommend save those antigen tests, even though the government stopped sending them out, they probably should have continued sending them out because this may be a better part of stopping the spread, testing yourself to make sure you're negative before you take off that mask and circulate with others because it is highly likely that asymptomatic recovered patients are spreading COVID. So that's what I mean by backloaded. Also, this is something Dr. Yamamoto says in many of his talks, symptoms don't predict risk. If you are asymptomatic, you finish your COVID infection, you could still be contagious. So even if you don't have symptoms, the risk is you're spreading COVID. So how do you manage your own Omicron? Stop doing those PCR tests. If you have a PCR that's positive or your antigen test is positive, don't do any more PCR tests. Remember, those are positive for up to 90 days. Only do it once if at all. You don't need a PCR test anymore. With symptoms and a positive antigen test, you have COVID. I suggest to people to start counting on day six or seven from their symptoms doing a home antigen test. Once your antigen test is positive, don't check it on day three or four. It's still gonna be positive. The earliest it could be negative is six or seven. And for most patients, I never see this. Uh, usually they're gonna be negative days 10 through 20. Preferably you would get two sequential negative home antigen tests to prove that you are no longer contagious. So that could happen anywhere between day seven and 21. In the meantime, if you were sick now, if you have laryngitis or adenovirus, not COVID, if you have respiratory syncytial virus, if you have any fever and upper respiratory illness, this that we used to teach everybody before 2020, cough into your arm, you know, it really doesn't help anybody anymore. We've proven that coughing in your arm doesn't work. If you want to be a good public health citizen, if you are sick, just put on a mask. I certainly would do it. It's, it's a better public health safety measure than doing this. And yet we taught all of our kids for the past 20 years, no longer cough in your hand, cough into your arm. So let's move from cough in your arm when you're sick to just wear a mask. It, you don't have to be a social pariah. It actually means you're being thoughtful. So we need to destigmatize mask wearing and instead see it as a polite thing to do. Cover your cough used to be considered polite, but you know, this is just spreading it to the person standing at your elbow. So let's think about wearing masks as something that's a public health measure. So why is this spread so much? Probably because people symptomatically recover, but they're still contagious. Uh, people mistook that five day rule. That was intended to get doctors and nurses and medical workers back to work. No one said you were better at day five. So please let's all get disabused of this bad guideline. This was a guideline intended to get medical workers back because we were short staffed. No one is magically better at day five. That's not how viral infection works. Antigen testing is not being routinely done to prove your contagious period is over. So that's how people are spreading it. And then people are mistaking this for allergies or the common cold, which I totally understand. There are people who have such mild symptoms and they figure I've got this antigen test sitting here, I'll just check it and they're positive. Also, our vaccines don't match this virus, and so it means that you get infected. It spreads easily. So the misconceptions about this virus and what's been happening lately are huge. I see these all the time in the media. One of them is that we're due for a spike or surge in the next few months, again, because it's seasonal and we're moving indoors. It, really, these surges have been driven by mutations, and right now we don't have anything stronger than Omicron 5A and 4A. Those are the ones that are dominating, and they've been dominating since they started in April. Another misconception is to get your influenza vaccine now. I hope I've disabused you of that notion. You really want to time your influenza vaccine for when we used to get our spike, which really is even based on last year's graph, more likely to happen in December, January, February, March. So getting your, your flu shot now only saves you an extra trip to the pharmacy. And if you are somebody who's working at 120 hour week and you cannot get out to get two shots in the next six months, Go ahead and get both of these shots at the same time. Um, again, that's a public health measure versus an individual health decision. Uh, are you too busy or you're just too lazy to get two shots? No, most of my patients are, uh, all of you watching, are incredibly good about your health and public health. So you'll get two shots spaced out. Also, do you really want the side effects of an influenza vaccine and a COVID vaccine at the same time? You don't have to do that to yourself. Uh, another misconception is the Paxlovid rebound rate is low. It's not because I prescribe Paxlovid at least 300 times. And when I calculate 
how many of my patients had rebound, it's more like 30%. And it looks like it is directly related to Paxlovid because I haven't had any patients, except for maybe in the past two months, have recurrent documented Omicron infection uh, come back on its own without Paxlovid. We just don't see that. Uh, there's also no evidence that Paxlovid prevents long COVID. There are research studies going on right now attempting to prove that, and that may be the case, but right now we don't have that data. Again, this is um, an old slide from the last talk about uh, reducing the dose for kidneys and for liver. Uh, many fewer prescriptions have been called in, again, because of lack of demonstration that this, this medication actually reduces symptoms. Uh, again, they stopped enrollment at Pfizer in the trial evaluating if it decreases uh, symptoms for four consecutive days. And it was no better than placebo. So it doesn't decrease your symptoms. It prevents hospitalization. And again, remember the slide I showed you about vaccination and boosters? Your risk of hospitalization if you've been vaccinated and or boosted is so low to begin with. Does Paxlovid really add to that? doesn't look like it. Uh, Omicron 5A, remember, evades our booster uh, and disease antibody neutralization, but we're hoping that this bivalent vaccine will let us do that. Uh, I don't actually think this is the worst version of the virus that we've seen uh, based on clinical experience taking care of hundreds of patients. There is immune escape, but maybe no longer because we have this new bivalent vaccine. Remember, the FDA authorization was for the BA1 vaccine and that partially neutralizes BA5, were they able to get this kind of immune activity into the bivalent Pfizer and Moderna vaccines? We will need to wait for the human data. Again, report your Pfizer um, uh, Paxlovid rebounds to the company. Remember, there are medication interactions, so don't just go ahead and start Paxlovid. You have to give your medication list to your provider so they can tell you what not to take, like Eliquis, Xeralto blood thinners, and statins. Uh, long COVID, just to remind everybody, is a lot like having mono. Uh, the Stanford study that was preliminarily reported that 67% of patients had autonomic dysfunction, meaning your blood pressure and heart rate, sweating, headache, the autonomic nervous system is very symptomatic with this. But we know how to treat it because we've been treating dysautonomia in patients for 20 years. Uh, it needs to be done under the supervision of a doctor who does know what they're doing. Uh, it's very similar to POTS recovery, but I think uh, once patients get into some of these long COVID studies, they will find some relief. Tony's tip of the week, do not call us for the flu shot now. Uh, maybe if you're traveling to a country like, or an area like South America where currently influenza should be circulating, then it would be okay to get your flu shot. But we really like to give them out in October, again, because I am a purist. I want your shot to work, and I want it to work when influenza is reaching high levels. Last year, there were some spikes in September and October, but again, those were national media stories at universities and colleges. They did not represent on that graph from the CDC a substantial number of influenza cases. Those really happened later in the year. Uh, again, early flu shots, if you're traveling to an area where it is currently uh, increasing, which are different parts of the world, we do not have the bivalent vaccine. The health department would require that we become a vaccine clinic for everyone. So that's the same reason why we didn't have the mRNA vaccines to begin with, because we would have to open our doors to the general population and we don't have the staffing for that. Don't think about doing the flu shot and the bivalent vaccine together. There's really no advantage. This hasn't been thoroughly tested. And generally speaking, you want your immune system to focus on one or the other. So unless you have a strong, compelling reason to do these two together, I would suggest that you do them separately. It is a public health recommendation to get in as many shots as possible that people do these at the same time. But if you find it within your ability and means to get these done separately, I strongly recommend that. So further reading and references, I just want to uh, highlight a couple of articles from which this talk was drawn. This one by Spencer Kimball at CNBC was just a couple of days ago. New Omicron boosters are now available, but it's unclear how effective they will be. This was a very good article, so I recommend you look that up if you have time. And this has been my favorite article for a long time. This is by uh, William Hazeltine, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, who is a former public health and Harvard faculty member. 
Five Days is Too Short. It's in Forbes. Uh, it is a great paper. It says basically everything I was saying uh, in this talk about testing after you have COVID and making sure that you're no longer contagious. The five days, again, was really meant to get doctors back to work. It wasn't based on saying that you're no longer contagious. You're no longer contagious when you have antigen tests that prove that you're not. Another very good article just for basic review on what these bivalent vaccines are. Uh, Brenda Goodman and CNN Health. That was another great article, and that was Friday, September 2nd. So for FAFS pitch, Paxlovid works, but it has a 20 to 30% chance of rebound, so consider that. It's also very effective in those over 65, but if you've been vaccinated and boosted, what additional benefit are you getting against hospitalization and severity? Maybe not much. Uh, we are still in the same COVID surge from April. It hasn't changed. Masks can prevent infection, but the current boosters may not. We don't know if the bivalent booster will. Don't do PCR tests if you're already positive. Uh, do not take off the N95 uh, mask until you're antigen negative, and preferably two, two days antigen negative. Uh, don't get the bivalent booster if you've been ill in the past 90 days because you might destroy your natural immunity or you just got boosted. And hold off on the flu shot until we're in traditional flu season. Remember your health pyramid. This is our book on stroke prevention and subscribe. Thank you.